also a lecture, uh, I'm also a lecturer of anesthesia in Ain Shams University Hospitals. Uh, I'll be speaking about infection prevention uh, in the COVID-19, uh, during this COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, everyone is just need to know that uh, during this pandemic, uh, the response is rapidly evolving and guidance will evolve and change as more information becomes, uh, becomes available. Uh, I'm not exaggerating if I say that uh, guidelines are really changing uh, like twice a week. Uh, it, it's evolving because there's still a lot we, we don't know about this pandemic. Uh, so, uh, in order to know a little bit about this, uh, uh, we need to know about routes of transmission of COVID-19. Uh, Public Health England uh, thinks that it's transmitted the same way as the 2003 SARS outbreak, which is mainly due, uh, uh, by two means, direct ways through respiratory droplets generated by coughing and sneezing, and indirect ways through uh, contaminate, uh, contact with contaminated surfaces. Uh, the incubation period is thought to be between one day and 14 days. And uh, during what we call uh, aerosol generating procedures or AGPs, there is increased risk of aerosol spread. So we treat the, in, the route of transmission as droplet, except during uh, performing one of the AGPs, we'll speak about them later in detail. Then during this procedure, we suspect that aerosol spread is, uh, is highly likely and we uh, perform airborne precautions during this time. This uh, picture just showed, uh, shows you uh, what's the difference between droplet and airborne transmission. It's mainly the size of the droplet and uh, the droplets doesn't remain suspended in air for long and if inhaled they don't reach the alveoli. And as you can see from the picture it's, uh, it's three to six feet the transmission of droplet so it's around two meters. That's why the WHO and everyone was uh, uh, recommending two meters uh, social distancing in order to limit the spread of the contamination with COVID-19. So before speaking about reducing the risk of transmission, if there is one and just one message from my talk today is that your safety as healthcare providers is the priority. Your safety is a priority, everything else comes second. All the guidelines, everything is being tweaked at the moment and it's been like this for a few weeks now to ensure safety of healthcare provider. This is the main message now. So it's not just personal protective equipment that reduce the risk of transmission. Uh, there are loads of things that can do that. The most important of them is hand hygiene, respiratory and cough hygiene, and we'll speak about that. Uh, patient use of face masks if appropriate, PPE or personal protective equipment, which is the most famous phrase worldwide right now between healthcare providers. Patient placement in, in patient settings like uh, isolating them or negative pressure rooms, managing visitors. And if we're talking practically speaking, which is the main idea of this course, to be practical, uh, all visitors are, are, are now prohibited from, the, from entering the hospitals in, in order to limit the transfer, the transfer of this uh, pandemic disease. Moving and transferring, uh, transferring patients in between the uh, facility, decontamination and the appropriate use or disposal of waste, linen and stuff in front of equipment. This all uh, is mostly related to every establishment guidelines and we'll not be talking about this in this talk. So hand hygiene. One of the most important ways to reduce the risk of transmission is hand hygiene and practically from the time you enter the hospital premises until the time you finish your shift and leave, you're doing tens and hundreds of hand washing during this day. It's basically before and after any direct patient care, any PPE uh, uh, usage, any uh, decontamination of equipment or any waste handling. But before you, uh, uh, using hand hygiene, we need to know that we need to expose our forearms, we need to remove all hand and wrist jewelry. No jewelry is allowed. Only sometimes we, uh, we allow wedding and uh, engagement bands, but no rings. In, uh, ensure fingernails are clean and short and all cuts and abrasions are covered with waterproof dressing. This is a very short video uh, issued by the NHS for the public information about uh, hand washing, the 20 second hand wash, but uh, it also, uh, it's also appropriate for uh, hospital settings. That's why I will leave you with this very short video.
I'm sorry for that. And this is a picture to show uh, the steps for uh, appropriate hand wash with soap and water. I'm sure every one of you knows how to do that. It's, it's the same as you, you perform it before any sterile procedure. If you don't have any running water or soap in your ward or your facility, then you have to do the hand hygiene using alcohol-based uh, alcohol hand drop. It's basically the same uh, steps, but using uh, hand drop technique. So what's the respiratory and cough hygiene? It's what we call it here, catch it, bin it, and kill it. So you catch your cough and sneeze with a tissue throw it in the bin immediately and then kill it by your hand hygiene. That's uh, how we, we limit the, the, the spread of this virus uh, through respiratory uh, uh, cough and sneezing. The patient use of face masks is only when appropriate uh, in, in waiting area and in, during transportation between wards in the same hospital, uh, but it, it might not be feasible if the patient is on uh, oxygen therapy or anything, so it might not be possible. And this is how, uh, how we see it on the walls of our hospitals, catch it, bin it and kill it. So what's about personal protective equipment, the most famous uh, phrase now in the world, what, what, PPE. The PPE, you have to, it's the same as I said in the, uh, earlier at the beginning, it's sworn to protect you, you as a healthcare provider. It protects you from being contaminated and the, spreading the contamination to other patients and other staff. But it's very important to know, it's very important that you must be trained in the proper use of all PPE. You have to be trained. If you're working in one of the lucky establishments that's not yet hit by the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, you have to use this time uh, training in the proper use of PPE. So what's PPE? It's, it's basically long sleeve disposable surgical gowns, non-steroid gloves, and in my hospital we use double gloves, so we wear uh, two of them, and the FFP3 respirator or mask. So it's very important, very important. FFP3 respirators will not be effective to protect you if you haven't done a, 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 a mask fit testing. You have to be tested to make sure that the mask is sealing, is making good seal between your skin and the mask, and there is no leak. So you have to be tested first for every kind of FFP3 mask you're going to use according to what's available in your facility, either as the FFP3 mask or the N95, whatever you have been tested. So the fit test is done only once, but you have to fit check it every time you enter uh, into a, a ward or a patient's area. And I will explain to you how we do the fit check later. Uh, if you are not fit tested or if you uh, failed your fit test for any reason, then you have to use the hood or the helmet. And finally, the eye or face protection through a visor or goggles. And you have to keep in mind that your prescription glasses, they don't protect you from infection. So what about facial hair and FFP3? If you're one of the guys who likes to keep a beard or a goatee or anything, uh, you will not be protected by the mask. This is very important. You have to be clean shaven for the FFP3 mask to make a good seal. Only the mustache can be applied. Any other form of beard, you're not protected. So if you, if you have a beard for any reason and you're wearing the mask, you have to know that you're not really protected, okay? So what's issues then? If you want to keep your beard, then you have to use the, uh, the hood. If you don't have the hoods in your hospital and you only have masks, you have to be clean shaven. I'm sorry for that. So what's the fit check that we have to perform before every time we enter a work area? It's basically when you wear the mask on, you, you, you tie the mask with both of your hands, you cover them with both of your hands, and depending if it's valved or not, you exhale sharply if it's unvalved or inhale sharply if it's valved product. If you find any ear leak around the nose, then you have to adjust the nose piece. If there is any flow around the edges, then you have to readjust the headband. This fit check is, it has to be done every time before entering the work area after being tested. And this is how we do it in our hospital. So you prepare the mask and then don it, check it, and then do the fit check with both of your hands as, as you can see in the picture. 
This is the most famous visual guide nowadays. And as I told you, it changes a lot. Every week you find a different picture. This is the most recent by Public Health England about the appropriate PPE and where to wear it exactly. You'll find that there are two areas, the orange area and the green area. So the orange area is the general contact with confirmed or suspected cases. And because this is a clinical uh, and practical course, you have to know that we don't have any more negative patients. All the patients you, that you deal with either they are suspected cases or they are confirmed cases. We don't have any more negatives. So you have to be wearing PPE with any contact with any patient either because they are either positive or they are suspected. If you're going into a world where there is a general population and you're not doing any aerosol producing uh, generating procedure, then you go with the orange bit and you wear a filled resistant surgical mask, the normal surgical mask uh, we use, uh, a disposable apron, plastic apron, and disposable gloves. That's what you need to wear. That's a PPE for this area. But if you're doing an AGP or you're entering a hot uh, spot or a hot zone, as we're going to say later, then you have to go full PPE. You have to wear your uh, visors for eye protection. You have to wear your FFP3 or hood, surgical gown, and disposable gloves. So it depends on which area you're going to work. And make no mistakes, there is a huge debate now and controversy about the safest PPE equipment and about preserving the stock of PPE because hospitals are running out of PPE. You have to know that. Hospitals are running off, out of PPE and some are heading this way. So to preserve the PPEs and to use appropriate uh, uh, protection, there is a huge debate about this, but this is the latest guide. And this is uh, by the Royal College of Anesthesia and the Intensive Care Society and a couple of other bodies. They, they base, it's basically the same. They, they arrange the hospital into three zones, the red zone, the orange, and the yellow zone. And to be frank, being an anesthetist as, uh, or intensivist as we all are, we basically live and work in the red zone. We will never be in the, uh, mostly will never be in the orange or the yellow. So in the red zone, you have to go full PPE. You have to wear gloves, aprons, uh, 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 gown, FFP3 or hood, and uh, your eye protection. In the events that you're going into an orange zone, which is here, you can see it's like a, a, a citing an epidural in labor ward. And this is an epi epidural in labor ward, not in theater. Then you might uh, go for the orange and use uh, the surgical mask. But if you're an OR, ICU, emergency department, or you're performing a, a, a resuscitation for a cardiac arrest, it's all red zones, it's all protection for airborne infection. You have to wear your full PPE for that. So what's the AGPs? What are the aerosol genetic procedures? It's actually, it's how we live as an anesthetist and intensive. It's, it's our daily routine uh, in our everyday life. It's intubation, extubation, open suction, and manual ventilation. These are the most dangerous AGPs. Tracheostomies and bronchoscopies are within them, OGDs and some dental procedures. And there is a, a controversy about NIV involving BiPAP and CPAP and high flame of the oxygen. But practically in my uh, uh, organization, all these are AGPs. We go full PPE during performing these procedures. So what are the hot spots? This is a new turn hotspot and session of PPE. Hotspots, they are describing the high risk in patient areas. So in these areas, AGPs are so frequent that the whole area is suitable for airborne precaution. So if you're entering a hotspot, if you're doing, uh, what, either you're doing an AGP or you're not doing an AGP, you're doing just a ward round in a hotspot, you have to wear your full PPE because AGPs are so frequent, the whole area is uh, susceptible for airborne infection. And session of PPE, that's a new term. It's a concept of wearing disposable PPE for more than one patient. It's, as I told you, it's trying to maintain stocks of PPE because they're running out very quickly, uh, faster than you can imagine. So basically, they, they, they said that gloves and aprons, the plastic aprons, they are always single-use patients. They are always disposable, and you have to perform hand hygiene before and after every patient. But for say, if you're doing ward round on ICU and you've got 10 or more patients, it doesn't make sense to don't end off all PPE between all patients. That doesn't make sense. So regarding your gown, your visor and your FFP3, this is for the whole session. That's why it's called session. For the whole session, say for ICU ward round, it's for the whole session, but gloves, aprons, they are disposable between every patient. So hotspots, as we said, they are treated as 
as if you're performing AGP, it's ICU, ED, NIV wars, OR, in the uh, endoscopies, it's basically everywhere in this and intensive score. And this is a sessional, uh, as I said, with a sessional PPE. So as you can see, aprons and gloves, always single use, never more than one patient, hand hygiene after every patient, and then FFP3s, eye protection uh, visors or goggles, and the long sleeve gowns, they can be session, they can last for the whole session. You, need, you don't need to change them between patients. And this is a quick guide, the latest by Public Health England regarding donning. It's different from one established to another, and you will find lots of pictures and videos online, which will be much easier than this. Practically speaking, as we said, the one thing I can, I can encourage working with lots of COVID-19 patients, before you don't and going in either to ICU or theaters, you have to make sure that you are well hydrated. You might be staying in there for an hour or two or more. You have to make sure that you're well hydrated, that you left everything that's in your pocket outside before donning. This is the one thing I stress on. Ensure that you're well hydrated. And this is how we doff. Uh, as I said, it's, it's, it's all over the internet. You can uh, get it from everyone, videos, and all, uh, every hospital has their own policy. It depends on what PPE they got for their stuff. But doffing is the most dangerous point of your work during the day. Most of healthcare providers who got infected in hospital settings got infected during the doffing procedure. That's why I said you need to practice before starting to work with patients, you need to practice how to don and off. This point is very, very important for your safety. And lastly, as I said, if you're one of this lucky establishment that's not yet hit by the pandemic, you have to take this time and think sim. So simulations, you have to uh, uh, increase your knowledge and be aware of the latest guidance. You have to improve your skills, rehearsing, donning and doffing. And practicing airway management in PPE is not with, as without, if you're wearing a heavy helmet or a tight mask and you're wearing everything and you've been in there for hours, then airway management is different. Drills and system and improvising uh, local policies, is, that's all you have to do now while waiting for, uh, for the cases to start coming for you. And finally, thank you. And as I said, your safety as a healthcare provider is a priority. All guidelines are being tweaked and changed to ensure your safety before anything else. So thank you and always stay safe. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ahmed. Uh, for it was very, it's very nicely presentation and. Uh, uh, you, you have just uh, brought us to the old days. Uh, I think uh, uh, the most important thing that uh, we, make, we make sure that you are fine, and this is good for our team to make sure that you are in the best health. Uh, uh, all the discussion uh, questions will be uh, at the end of the session. So uh, uh, we will start uh, performing the other uh, lecture by uh, our dear colleague, Dr. Yassin Zerloul. Uh, he's a consultant in anesthesia and intensive care in uh, Sheikh Khalifa, United, uh, United Arab Emirates, and he's, uh, he's going to present us a lecture uh, for transportation. Uh, uh, welcome, Dr. Yasser, uh, and please uh, join us. And uh, as you see, my talk will be about the transportation of the COVID patient. Maybe this is not uh, so important, the points, but uh, you, you will see many patients need to And uh, as you see, my talk will be about the transportation of the COVID patient. Maybe this is not uh, so important, the points, but uh, you, you will see many patients need to And uh, as you see, my talk will be about the transportation of the COVID patient. 
maybe this is not uh, so important the points, but you will see me differently. And uh, as you see, my talk will be about the transportation of the COVID patient. Maybe this is not uh, so important the points, but you will see me differently. And uh, as you see, my talk will be about the transportation of the COVID patient. Apologies for the technical failure. Uh, so we'll just leave you for a minute till we adjust that with Dr. Yasser Zaglul. Are you ready, Dr. Yasser? Uh, our apologies for the technical failure. Uh, so we'll just leave you for a minute till we adjust that with Dr. Yasser Zaglul. Are you ready, Dr. Yasser? Hello, Salam Alaikum. Uh, our apologies for the technical failure. Apologies for this technical problem. So we are going to Dr. Mohammed Elgain be back. So, Dr. Mohammed, if, if oh, thank Dr. you, is thank ready, you, Dr. Ali. Thank you, Dr. Ali. Uh, it's a, a little bit technical problem, and we apologize for everybody. I think if uh, we can be ready with Dr. Ahmad Madi uh, uh, for the next lecture, till Dr. Yasser is uh, updated with us. Uh, Dr. Ahmed will speak to us about the essential procedures for covered infected patients, uh, and it will be a very, very interesting lecture uh, by uh, Dr. Ahmed Modi. If he is ready, uh, we are waiting for him. Uh, just for uh, those who didn't know, Dr. Ahmed uh, uh, nearby he is an assistant professor uh, of uh, anesthesia and critical care medicine, Tanta University, and he is now. Uh, responsible for the training program of the fellowship uh, in the King Saud uh, Hospital in the uh, KSA. Uh, and he is one of the leaders of uh, critical care medicine in our uh, Middle East and Gulf area. And uh, lastly, and not least, uh, that he is one of my, uh, uh, my dear colleagues and one of the co-chairs of this uh, meeting. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ahmed. Thank you, Dr. Mohammed, so much. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Uh, actually, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for this. And I would like actually to thank even the, organ all the organizing committee for this event. So, uh, as Dr. Mohammed Jindi mentioned, actually, we have a very hot topic, which is the uh, which is the aerosolized generating procedures. 
right? Uh, as Dr. Labib mentioned earlier about the uh, transmission of the disease for the healthcare workers, you can see it here actually either by droplets of the airborne droplet with large droplets more than five microns and doesn't reach the distal alveoli. Airborne it does. And you had look actually to those pictures, those visualized generous procedures, looks like a heavy rain. Above, above the health school workers, apart from the robot infection from, from the others. So the definition of aerosolized generated procedures is that the procedure that generates aerosols and the droplets and the source of respiratory pathogens. And even despite all healthcare, pro all healthcare protocols worldwide, still healthcare workers are usually at the risk for infection disease transmissions. During SARS and MERS COVID, MERS COVID outbreak, as well as COVID-19, now many frontline health care workers got infected. And unfortunately, they reached to a severe disease and even death. The study we had mentioned, we have, we are, we are present, we published actually from the Saudi Arabia about the MERS COVID. It shows over the 330 cases of critical ill patients with MERS COVID, approximately 10% of them was healthcare workers and hospital mortality reaching between 25% between healthcare workers. The nurses were the majority of the people affected, after that the physicians and the ER, the main scene for the people of healthcare workers that were affected. Of course, the news telling us about the same in each country for COVID-19. In China, they published in the newspaper on the 11th of February that 1,700 healthcare workers got infected, six of them died. And two days back, unfortunately, Italian doctors, they posted 100 doctors have died from COVID-19 from the Italy. And of course, it is the time now to express my deep condolence for the family of the first doctor died of the COVID-19 in Egypt. Dr. Ahmed al Lawah, he's a microbiologist, he's a professor of the clinical, micro, uh, clinical pathology at Al-Azhar University, and unfortunately, he's discovered while he's working in his lab with the COVID-19. So my deep condolence to him and his family. The healthcare workers are the most common people they are actually exposed for the uh, infection because they have prolonged exposure, they have inadequate hand hygiene, which is Dr. Labib mentioned in details how to do it, as well as inadequate personal protective equipments, insufficient spa spacing or uh, availability of the negative pressure rooms. And one from the most important factor is dispersion of air, of inhaled air during the procedure, which is very essential. The Canadian people, they did systematic review for 10 publications actually for in Canada and in China and in Shanghai, Singapore, they found that actually this systematic review over 10, they are assessing the risk of transmission of acute respiratory infection to healthcare workers exposed to patients undergoing procedures, comparing with the healthcare worker doesn't set for the procedures. They found healthcare worker exposed to the tracheal intubation mainly procedures had a higher risk of disease transmission, if you can see it here, was odd ratio of six in comparison with the people who they did it exposed to the procedure. It means that the tracheal intubation one from the most dangerous or risky procedures. And in the same literature, they give us how the severity and risk factor for the procedures. If you can look to this table, actually, you will find tracheal intubations, airway management, and the cardiac arrest, manipulation of the pipette, as well as oxygen mask suctioning, non-invasive ventilations, and the collection of the sputum sample, all of those in the health worker have a higher risk for the health worker to get infected. And the dispersion of the air, actually, very, very important. Exhaled air dispersions during back mask ventilation. If you can see it here, actually, back mask ventilation performed in the simulation lab by the anesthetist. They are holding the bag mask ventilation with different types, your tail, AMBO, and they will add actually AMBO bag mask with, with filter. And they found us displaying the laser dispersion, at least dispersion distance, when adding a filter, as you can see here, when adding a filter to the bag mask ventilation with the AMBO bag type, actually the least dispersion of the air during exhalation. And not only that, they found, they found the nurses 
are the most people they can leak while they are handling the back mask application rather than the expert. For that, in all literature and recommendations, the most expert people, they have to do with the airway. Actually, all the healthcare authorities, they are saying you have to wear surgical mask in the normal hospital as well as the mask with FFP2 mask, which is almost level two category for the PPE, which is equal by the American N95. But while you are going to perform aerosolized generation procedures, you have to go with the level three with at least FFP3 mask during the airway management or generalized uh, or generating procedures. And many, many literature and many authorities coming to tell us how to deal with the healthcare worker who they are dealing with the airway management, especially intubation. Safe Airway Society, as well as Intensive Care Medicine, they published a lot of guide actually to tell us how to deal with such case. And a few days back, actually, the ESA, European Society of Cardiologists, they have some certain recommendation, which is almost looks like all authorities. They have to say, you prepare well, you have to have a plan for intubations, and you have to structure briefing is a must, identify a negative pressure environments, you have to maximize, maximize your pre oxygenation as well as minimize the apnea and the ventilation. They recommend, and uh, all of us agree, elective better than emergency. So don't wait to have emergency situation to deal with the intubations. It has to be elective early, and as much as you can minimize the personnel teasing, dealing with the such intubations, at the end, level of the aerosolized genetic procedure has to be PPE3. Level FB3. And also, when you are using the, uh, any, any devices, you have to keep filter in between any interface between the patient and any device you are using. Rapid sequence intubation, of course, for all patients and limiting mask ventilations. Full dose to be sure that the patient will not coughing during your procedure of neuromuscular blockage. And it's better to use video laryngoscope to keep a space, to keep a distance between your face and patient distance. And of course, early switch, if you have difficult intubation, go to the early switch to the sobergrotic airway device. And if you still have, cannot intubate or you cannot oxygenate your patients early, cricothyrotomy, this is the plan you have to set at the beginning with your team. Use capnograph, don't auscultate the chest, because actually to assist the, the position of the tube, even to process the endotracheal rather than endotracheal, they recommend to go with the X-rays and avoid avoid any disconnection without clamping of the tube. The Safe Society Association they have a model actually to tell us this is the optimal scenario for the patient to during intubation. If you can see it here, if you have outside room and you have anti room would be the best. This anti room actually the uh, personnel can change his PPE and they can wear this one in the, in, the, in, the, in the clean area. Then he can go inside. If you go inside to this model, model you have find actually three personnel. The first one is airway operator and his assistant and the team leader at the end. And this is the negative pressure room. All of those red colors, they are wearing PPE3 level. If you don't have these facilities, actually, at least you can find the way to decrease the exposure to the trans to the uh, aerosolizations. Some people, they're doing like intubation box, whatever you are using it actually just to minimize the uh, exposure to the droplets during the procedure, during intubation. And actually, this intubation box a New England Journal of Medicine, they did found that actually, if you can see it here, the droplets without box coming even to the face shield. But with using a box, you are minimizing so much uh, a droplet infection. Not only during intubations, during extubation also. It is the same hazards during extubation, the same risk factor. So points to be remembered during extubation. You are dealing with extubation as well as intubation. So you have to avoid visualizations. You have to minimize your staff exposures and keep on your mind, keep optimized patient conditions, strictly adherent to your protocol, even make the threshold for intub extubation very low to extubate your patient in very critical situation to avoid re-intubation back. Prepare and check your equipment's effort to minimize coughing. Even they recommend to sometimes to get some medication to decrease your and, and uh, coughing like uh, any drugs like narcotics or lidocaine. So, actually, I retrieved some slide from Dr. Chin. He was presenting in March 26 of 2020 about how Chinese people dealing with the 
these situations. Actually, it's very impressive. Everyone entered the contaminated area, they are labeled as category two of PPE. Category two for China, it is, means double face mask, double medical caps, double pairs of gloves, and double pairs of boots, and all of them are disposable, as you can see it here in the top. If the healthcare worker going for the any procedure, actually, he will exclude to category three. Category three means he's adding to this one more cap, one more surgical gown, one more pairs of gloves, as well as pair of boots, and all of them are disposable, as you can see in this, in this picture. And he posted some of the procedures they are doing actually in Wuhan. You can see here intubation in, in Wuhan or bronchoscope in Wuhan, they are using disposable fiber optic bronchoscope, as well as portable purified system, purification system, and this is a tracheostomy in Shanghai. And the most two important steps, in my opinion, which is training hands-on for every personnel, how to wear, how to use PPE, what are the categories. And not only that, they have dedicated personnel for checkpoints before the healthcare worker going for the room or doing any procedure, he check his PPE in details. And after exit also, he check how he's doffing his PPE. And fortunately with this, precautions, strictly precautions, COVID-19 infection among 42,000 medical staff sent to Wuhan with these precautions reach it to 0%. Really, it's good and amazing. I hope we can do that. Not only the intubations, we have many surgical procedures need to be done for COVID-19 patients. So the NSS have to be aware how to deal with such case. He has to have personal protection in the priority. He has to know that. He has to should manage it in the designated room with negative pressure. Should need to be brought, the patient has to be go direct to the OR, no holding area, no post anesthesia carry on it. Recovery either in the operating room or in the ICU. And the patient has to wear mask all over the time. And have a special dedicated hallway to go through. If the assist can go with the regional anesthesia, it would be better than to decrease the coughing, to decrease the strain, to decrease the isolations. Anti emetic can be routine to decrease the coughing, as well as minimizing the stuff and that's on. Another one from the highest risky procedure dealing with the aerosolization is cardiac arrest. If you are going with the CBR for such case, it is very essential and with most of the recommendation actually guideline by either resuscitation council by ALS or even advanced cardiac care support by the America, they focused on if your patient is in at the phase one, don't resuscitate him. In phase two, with assessing your patient, actually, you have to have to wear category two of PPE, disposable gloves, disposable apron, failure with resistance surgical mask, as well as disposable eye protection. But when you go in with a chest compression or even defibrillation in this phase, you have to remember with, you have to wear level three PPE. You have to escalate your PPE. And we have some recommendation, actually, you have to prepare a stop, safe approach, is the patient for CBR or not, then don't PPE. Don't proceed for CBR, unless you and the everyone dealing with the patient wearing PPE. Don't put your face near your patient, keep it away as much as you can. You have to have appointed gatekeeper to check full PPE for all the stuff. And after you finish to improve the quality of the, uh, of the, of the uh, dealing with such patients, do the briefing after you will finish. Just published the circulation American Heart Association with all association of the USA, the principle, the key principle for advanced cardiac life support for a patient. The main three key principles, reduced provider exposure, prioritized oxygenation and the ventilation strategies with lower exploitation risk, and to consider your goal of resuscitation as well as the protocol determ to de determination of the CBR. We have many others procedures dealing with the, uh, with the patient. Like for example, if you are doing option therapy for the patient, don't forget when you are dealing with any type of option therapy for such case, don't use humidifier during, during conventional option therapy. When you are using non-invasive ventilation support, use a double limb circuit instead of one circuit, place filter everywhere in the expiratory limb near, near the ventilator, in the inspiratory limb near the ventilator, and another one near the patient. Helmet equipped with an inflatable mask cushion is the best one. And actually, for these reasons, the, the, for this one, you can find that actually here, the 
free trial for the uh, uh, non-invasive ventilation with the helmet, you can find. This is the gray with the laser lights. We have actually leaking here from the helmet if you are using it without cushion, without inflatable cushions, and actually helmet without cushion, the dispersion distance will be 27 centimeters. As well as if you're using full mask for the patient, it will leak from the port on the front of the exhalation, exhalation area of the mask and reaching total face mask with 92 centimeter dispersion distance. The best is helmet with the neck caution, almost negligible ill dispersion. Another type of oxygenation parameter therapy if you are using, if you are planning to use high, high flow nasal oxygen, nasal cannula, be sure it is well fitted. It will be secured with the nostril and they place a surgical mask even over the laser cannula for the patients. Back mask ventilation, if needed, try to avoid it as much as you can. But if needed, place filter between the valve and the mask or into the care tube and use closed circuits in case of suction is needed. Because actually, this is very important because closed suction of the air, it will be decreasing the exhaled air for the patients. If you are doing a bronchoscope, and it is preferable to be actually, in case of emergency, try as much as you can to avoid electric bronchoscope. This is highly oscillated procedures. Of course, you have to do level three BBE. You have to ensure head and eye coverage for, for the patients. You have to cover his with surgical mask, with his mouth, even with the bronchoscope inside, and use continuous suction, and don't forget after you finish, you have to disinfect your body as well as your ear and mouth. Continuous suctioning, actually, in simulation lab, they found it. Suctioning decreased the spread of exhaled air during coughing, as you can see it here in these figures, by 30%. And the continuous suctioning is more better than intermittent suctioning. So it's preferable to keep suction tube inside the mouth while, while you're doing the procedures. So I here I can end with my suggestion of keynotes. My opinion, what's make difference between nations are national protection rules, national resources and in our hand strictly you have to be compliant and adherent with the, with the infection control measurements and at the end i hope every one of you stay safe and pray thank you so much thank you dr ahmed uh, that was a very nicely presented uh, lecture about a uh, very dangerous and very critical uh, issue about using the PPEs in the aerosolized generating procedures. Uh, we, will, we will make the, the lot of questions we are receiving here uh, till the end of the session, and we are moving back to Dr. Yassir Zarlul, uh, if he can hear me. Dr. Yes. Okay, please join us. Yeah, welcome. I hope uh, you have a good sound now. It was a problem in the sound, but now it is okay. So my talk, as you see, about the transportation of COVID patient, whatever the patient already inside the hospital, Here, as you see, the before the extubation, successful extubation of a first ventilated OV patient, and we follow all the BBE mentioned by Dr. Labib. Now, we have the general precautions for transfer of critically ill patient. Whatever the patient was COVID or not was COVID, and special precaution for COVID patient. So in general, we have to follow the safety for the patient and the health care workers, and to be ready for the medication and the equipment, and of course, the proper documentation and the communication with your team and the clean plan for transfer, especially if the patient is going for the other hospital. So now you have to prepare yourself, you have to prepare your team, you prepare your patient, 
all the file and the document should be ready. And medication equipment, the equipment used in the ambulance is sometimes different than the one used in ICU. So you should be familiar with this equipment. Of course, communication with the ambulance team and the receiving the hospital. So now we are talking before about the burnout of the ICU physician or of the anesthesiologist. You can see during the attack in Wuhan, in China, they are able to prepare 10,000 beds. 42,000 healthcare workers, this covering around 5,000 or 6,000 sick patients. From this health team, 790 anesthesiologists and total divided to the 346 medical team to manage the patient. So you need a strict safety, as it is mentioned before in the first lecture for the healthcare workers team. Now, how you are preparing everything? If you have a complication with the transfer, it may be due to personal factors, system factors, or patient factors. Always this is harm to your patient. That's why we have to repeat again about the importance of the proper and the good preparation of all these items. Medical team, of course, should be oriented about the patient uh, condition and have experience in the patient transfer and aware about the medication and the, again, equipment used during transfer of your patient. And we have some controversy if you are in a small hospital and referring to the large hospital. So who is the transfer team? Usually, if you have limited resources, the receiving hospital can send their team and take the patient. You have should be ready, of course, for the medications and the equipment. And I may focus on the patient medication. Some patient may need his antiviral, antibiotic, patient anti-epileptic, patient anti therapy, and it may be long distance for transfer. So we should be ready regarding this issue. Of course, the equipment, airway, ventilator, monitor, infusion pump, this, uh, everybody is aware about this preparation. Now, the current recommendation to minimize the transfers by using alternative point of care ultrasound. For example, if the patient has poor chest, you can do lung uh, ultrasound to check to minimize the transfer of COVID patient. Actually, the transfer may cause nosocomial transmissions, and it is mental and physical stress to the medical team. And again, you have to minimize this stress and either physical or mental in your nurses and in your physician as well. Intra-hospital transfer, the patient may need transfer from the ICU to the other ICU or other ward. He may need some surgery. The patient may need radiology, chest CT, this is the most common. And in some situations, the patient may need Tesla. Or simply, the patient may be transferred from the ER to the ICU. So we should have a special elevator or a special corridor to move your patient in this situation. Again, limit the transfer, a special elevator or corridor for the infected patient in general, and limit the number of equipment. The more number of equipment, the more the adverse effect or the more uh, complications may happen. Isolation during transfer. As you see, during the intubation of the patient, we can cover the whole patient with plastic. We can do the same during intra-hospital transfer by covering the whole trolley by plastic as well. In some studies, they found that they increase the incidence of ventilator-associated pneumonia when the patient needs transfer uh, inside the hospital. So again, if you minimize the transfers, you may reduce the incidence of ventilator-associated pneumonia. Now, in this study, they studied the more than 260 transport of the critically ill patient inside the hospital 
and they recorded around 45.8% adverse event for the patient. And the com most common, as you see, agitation, desaturation, and we have hemodynamic instability, some problem in the line, the patient may need increase in the vasopressors dose, some problem in the arterial and the castor line as well, disconnection and the accidental extubation, this is the list. So along the list of side effect or adverse event, you have to minimize it as you can. The risk factor of adverse event, if the patient need be more than six, this may be so the oxygenation is a little bit poor. If you take more than four infusion pumps with you, a more adverse event, the patient may be hypovolemic, needed fluid challenges, still hemodynamic unstable. Again, this increases the incidence of adverse event and the change of the situation. Patient in ICU in midazolam fentanyl and they stop the eat and they put him on propofol infusion or intermittent bolus of propofol. So, of course, the agitation will be higher incidence as we saw. Now we come to the transfer between two hospitals. Mode of transmission depend on the many factors. Usually you are using ambulance or helicopter. But the choice depends on the diagnosis, severity of illness, risk of deterioration during the transport, what is the distance between the two hospitals, and of course the local geography and the weather, and if the patient in the ambulance may be considered the traffic conditions, of course. Before uh, inter-hospital transfer, you need good physician-to-physician -physician communication, and we have to focus here in COVID patient, no paperwork, electronic document transfer, either by email or, for example, WhatsApp, whatever, but minimize the paperwork as you can. And uh, this document should include the clear summary of the patient condition and the progress of the clinical situation. Of course, current clinical finding, relevant lab and the radiological results, major intervention performed and the patient response. For example, your patient has pleural effusion or lung collapse, you inserted intercostal drain, repeated the X-ray, the effusion was drained and the lung expansion is better and the oxygenation improved. Now we have the usual transfer of the patient by ambulance. And as you see, the ambulance team, transfer team, take all the precautions during the transfer. And if we compare between the ambulance and the helicopter, the helicopter is be better, of course, in the time and should be used if the range of transfer more than 160 kilometer. But the disadvantage, the cabin is poor, very limited space. It is difficult to do maneuver inside the helicopter. The space in ambulance is wide and you can do suction proper positioning of the patient, etc. Now, helicopter and ambulance, it is not the only mode of transfer on COVID patient. You can see here in France, they transferred some patients from area of low resources or higher infection to the area with less infection and the better resources. So they used the train and they medicalized several of high speed trains to be ready of transfer of the patient. And the first service was done on 26th of March and they transported 20 critically ill patients and the medical team was two intensive care physician, three nurses and one as a sociologist covering 20 patients. And you can see here the patient in his way to the train and after that, inside the train, the stretchers were fixed over or across the top of the passenger seats, either the patient ventilated or not ventilated. But you have 20 critically ill patients transferred already by the train. Something unusual happened in the United States. They have cruise ship. And there is more than or approximately 2,000 persons, and they are for 27 days in the team. They have attacked by coronavirus. Four passengers died, 
and you have 13 critical ill patient already on the ship. And you are going now by the ambulance and you need to take the patient from the crossed ship to the ambulance. So it is a load on the ambulance and the transport team as well. You need to manage this 13 critically ill patient as you are doing in ICU, either airway management, hemodynamic support, fluids, extra. You need to do all for that. And how many persons from the ICU physician, nurses or ambulance should go to manage these 13 patients? So it is another challenge for uh, transportation. All of us are aware about the problem happened in Italy. There is no enough ventilator, no enough ICU bed. So uh, Germany helped Italy for transfer of some critically ill patient using Airbus uh, medical evacuation aeroplane, which is mainly military aeroplane, but it contains 44 beds, 16 beds already prepared with ventilator and 25 medical staff. You can see the bed here arranged in three rows and all the equipment ready for ICU is ready in this aeroplane. And you can see as well the medical uh, seats is ready. So 44 patients can be transferred by this aeroplane. Now we have to take the experience of the doctor, nurses and the ambulance persons already involved in the uh, transport of uh, patient. And this is study or these interviews were done in Norway. The common comment from the medical team, the unusual hospital. Um, maybe you're having uh, some troubles uh, again with uh, uh, Dr. Yasser Zarlul connection. Actually, his, uh, his uh, lecture was very interesting, uh, and we are uh, learning a lot about uh, transportation uh, through water, through air, and everywhere uh, on the continent. Uh, I may, uh, I may uh, like to spare a couple of minutes uh, till uh, Dr. Yasser is uh, coming back to us. Uh, if there is any possibility, uh, he can contact us. We will uh, wait for a minute or a couple before uh, uh, getting uh, prepared for another uh, speaker. Uh, hope uh, he can do it in uh, the next 30 seconds. Uh, Dr. Yasser. Okay. Uh, I think uh, we can we can shift our uh, our talk to the next speaker. Unfortunately, we are uh, a, a bit a bit lack of time, uh, so we can uh, we uh, Dr. Yassi will join us again in the discussion panel at the end of this session. Uh, but now uh, we can shift uh, to Dr. Ahmed Al Haddad. Uh, he uh, Dr. Ahmed Haddad is a senior consultant of intensive care medicine uh, at Saint Mary. Uh, hospital uh, in the United Kingdom. Uh, he's one of the of the leading uh, consultants in the intensive care medicine uh, in UK. He's, uh, he's a senior consultant examiner in the e European Society of Intensive Care Medicine. He is a faculty member in the uh, European Intensive Care Medicine Faculty of, Ma faculty of Intensive Care. Uh, Tour Ahmed is going to talk to us about the structural and staffing uh, surge planning, uh, his own experience. He is uh, uh, a very well experienced uh, physician and uh, a very good friend of me as uh, usual. But uh, this time he was uh, he, 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 he was studying in, at Ancient University with us and uh, 
uh, he was he's one of the graduates of Shams University. I hope he is fine and he will share us his great experience uh, by now. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed. Please uh, welcome. Thank you, Mohammed. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, sure. Your okay, voice is uh, going fine. I, I yeah. know you are on duty. I know that you are on duty. Yes, I am. Uh, but uh, thankfully, I've arranged for some cover. I'm just <laughs> having an issue with the screen, uh, trying to upload my presentation now. Take your time. Take your yeah. time. We are, uh, we are all uh, very grateful for you joining us. Uh, just your presentation is on, on the screen, actually. You can go. OK. And the voice is good. Voice is just perfect. Great, great. Um, I'm really grateful to be here. Thank you so much for allowing me to be part of this. It means a lot to me. Just to remind everyone, uh, I am uh, one of the consultants at St. Mary's Hospital in London. And today I want to share my experience with everyone, how we are facing the COVID pandemic, how we have restructured our hospital and how we have restructured our teams. Um, so to give you an idea, how did we start? Pre-COVID, we are a hospital uh, of, San, of Imperial College Healthcare Trust. We have three hospitals working together, three teaching hospitals, and we are part of a bigger network of nine hospitals working in Northwest London. We serve a quarter of London population. Uh, London has 8 million people, and pre-COVID, London had 800 intensive care beds. At Imperial, we had in the three hospitals, 58 intensive care and HDU beds, and we had a cardiac intensive care and a pediatric intensive care that are not included in those numbers. So the expectations that the NHS had from us when the crisis started, that we will double or triple our capacity, our trust of three hospitals is expected to provide 143 beds. We had a surge plan and a super surge plan if the situation is um, worse. And at the same time, the British government and the army were arranging Nightingale Hospital, which is a big 4,000 bed intensive care unit. And the overall plan was that London has to have 5,000 beds all across the city. So we started by, of course, training. We did a lot of uh, personal protective equipment training to all staff in the intensive care and in other departments. We did a lot of simulation, uh, looking at how we will intubate people, how we will move people across from A&E to the ICU, from ICU to radiology and theaters. Very early on, our hospital canceled elective activity, and that was the biggest move uh, that facilitated a lot of consequent things after that, because we mobilized a big team of anesthetists and a big team of surgeons to help us. We designed a multi-team rota and we started also to restructure uh, the teams in the world. So intensive care um, deployed all the anesthetists and the surgeons and the ward teams deployed all the subspecialties. So basically it was a one medical rota having cardiologists, endocrinologists, everyone in one acute medical rota supported by a parallel respiratory physician rota because I'm sure you all agree the crucial role of respiratory physicians in such crisis. We thought that intensive care will be busier, but we actually saw that our colleagues in medicine have um, had to deal with much more than we anticipated. So what we have done, we identified our new intensive care units. So we have our intensive care originally here in my building is a 32 bed unit on one floor. And we had theaters on the fourth floor and we had a pediatric intensive care. Thankfully, this disease is not after children, so we utilized all our pediatric intensive care of 17 beds. And um, this is a unit that is fully staffed with pediatric intensivists and trained nurses and fully equipped. And thankfully, um, in a few days, they were almost independent. They needed very little support from us, and they stepped up to the crisis really, really well. Um, we also opened another unit in the recovery bay. Our main recovery area in the hospital has 17 beds. And we allocated intensive care nurses plus recovery nurses plus um, anesthetic doctors supporting them. We also have modified other wards in the hospital and we just started this week 
transferring our endoscopy unit into CPAP ward with an intubation bay uh, next to it. So we also have to redesign our model of care because we are now dealing with a much bigger number of patients. So the original standards in the UK is that a consultant intensivist looks after 15 patients. And this was actually supposed to be 12 very soon. Um, now, of course, the situation has totally changed. So what we have done guided by NHS England is that the, we have moved all the intensive care consultant one step backwards to look after a bigger number of patients. And we designed small cohorts of patients that we call pods, uh, which can be anything between five and 20 beds. And we had a consultant anesthetist or a senior intensive care trainee looking after those pods. And we inject a lot of manpower into those pods by adding a lot of surgical trainees, working with our intensive care trainees, adding a lot of anesthetic trainees. And we also moved our nurses into a broader picture and gave them a lot of helpers and assistants from the wards. And they did a lot of training on the job. So as you can see, this it's all ended up in a big hierarchy of um, personnel looking after a much bigger number of patients. We ended up in this building going from 32 beds into 70 beds, and they are now all functioning. So this is how the model is now. So we have uh, an ICU consultant working uh, with pod leaders supervising two to three pods. Each one of them in average has 15 patients. The pod leaders so far are, intent, are anesthetic consultants, which is uh, a big, big relief uh, because we didn't have to open a lot of pods. So we have enough anesthetic consultants now to do this. And in the, inside the pod, there are pod doctors, which are a mix of intensive care and other specialty trainees. And there is a lower number of intensive care nurses. We're not, of course, doing the standard ratio of one to one. So now we have one nurse looking after four patients, but helped by ward nurses and volunteers and healthcare assistants. In parallel, we designed those teams, uh, I'm sure you heard about, that made the situation much more manageable for us. So we have now a proning team that is formed of physiotherapists, orthopedic doctors, and some other doctors from other specialties. And we had the biggest uh, help possible from the anesthetic team by designing the airway or intubation teams. And this is a team formed by a consultant anesthetist or two uh, going on shifts 24 seven and they intubate patients everywhere, including ICU. They are now a big, big help. Like I timed them last weekend. They intubated three sick patients in 20 minutes. So things will get very efficient for them because they're doing this a lot. We also still has our uh, standard cardiac arrest team, and we designed a triage team by one of our ICU consultants to look at all the patients referred into intensive care. Um, we got some guidance from um, NHS England, and this guidance is designed to super search numbers. So the guidance are going as far as one consultant intensivist looking after 60 patients. So if you can see here, uh, the two columns on the right um, side, you have a supervising consultant, which is an IC consultant looking after 60 patients, doing supervisory ward rounds, um, supporting a senior clinician who is either an anesthetic consultant or a senior trainee supporting a team of juniors. In parallel to that, we have the coordinating consultant who is a consultant looking at every new referral to intensive care and also coordinating the beds because we now have four different places. So they coordinate which patient goes where. Um, this is more guidance from the NHS England about the parallel teams, cardiac arrest team, transfer team. We have an anesthetic registrar here helping with transfers. And if no transfers, they help with proning. Um, we also are working now much easier with the rapid intubation team and they're working 24 seven. We have not yet designed arena support team, but that's a guidance that we will hopefully follow, but we have not put a lot of patients on infiltration uh, yet five weeks down the line. Um, 
there is also something that we just started, which I'm expecting would be a big help, which is the Lions team. Um, that is a team that will put all the IV access and we have a massive uh, treasury of vascular surgeons and interventional radiologists because that's uh, something we are very specialized in my hospital in. So we will use the vascular surgeons and the interventional radiologists to put lines. So that will make the job easier for the teams doing the actual care. We also expanded our critical care outreach team because the amount of referrals coming from the hospital is of course much bigger than um, how it was. Last week, we used to have 20 to 30 referrals to intensive care in 24 hours. Um, and roughly, we used to take three to four patients a day to intubate. Um, this is the situation now in the United Kingdom, four weeks down the line. Um, we had, last week, we had approximately 2,500 intubated patients in the whole country. Roughly half of those are in London only because London is the city that had the biggest um, numbers. Um, so we have definitely exceeded 1,500 intubated patients now in London, especially after uh, the Nightingale Hospital has started. And we are using, we are functioning as networks and that's something that um, I really want to highlight. We have networks of hospitals in the NHS and in London. And my network of nine hospitals, for example, have a hospital that is located in a very high density population area, very similar uh, um, population design to Cairo, like big families living together. Um, and because of, I think, the, the distribution of the population, this hospital was hit the most with uh, like I think by the second week they had zero capacity they had more than 50 intubated patients in one building and we started doing rescue interventions to move patients from that hospital in the first days of their crisis they gave us to the rest of the network 10 intubated patients a day for some days um, but I just can't imagine having this hospital dealing with this without the networks so networking is something I really, really uh, encourage. People should work together and hospitals should be really linked. Now we are on really cruising altitude with those networks and our beds are all centrally managed. One medical director of the nine hospitals is managing who goes where uh, so that we don't have a hospital that is doing nothing and a hospital that's doing a lot. And we have now distributed the load on, on everyone and they are also allocating the resources centrally, like the PPE. And when we buy new ventilators, they just distribute it evenly over all the hospitals. Uh, the challenges that we are facing now, um, I think we have done well um, restructuring our place. Many people stepped up to the challenge, like uh, our anesthetic colleagues, our pediatric intensive care. But everyone is working, of course, uh, beyond capacity. Now we're dealing with a big number of patients. While I'm, I'm now on call and I'll be in charge of around 55 patients tonight, the continuity is really difficult because eventually when you have that big number of patients, they all merge into your brain into one patient and it's a single disease. And now the hospital is almost a single disease hospital. So continuity is a big challenge. We are working on that to make sure someone knows the patient and someone is driving their plans forward. We are also uh, not yet on top of things with long-term care. Many of those patients will be slow to wean. Many of those patients will have tracheostomy, which is another issue uh, due to the risk of staph infection. We just put a new protocol for uh, inserting tracheostomies in theaters. Weaning will be a big challenge, especially that we are now using anesthetic machines for many patients because we did not have enough standard intensive care ventilators. We're waiting for new ventilators, but those patients who are getting better on the anesthetic machines are a big challenge to win because the machines are not as good as intensive care ventilators. Um, and of course, the long-term sequelae that this will have on us and on the system generally is something that we are yet to face. Um, more um, challenges that we are facing as well are the fact that we are operating beyond capacity for, for a long time. We have now a rate of 10 to 20% staff sickness. 
and we are dealing with this. We have redesigned our rotors to have one uh, and two lines of sickness cover. So some people will be staying at home, but they know that they may be asked to cover uh, if someone is sick. Uh, of course, it's a really heavy time and we deal with low staff morale at many uh, points. And we just started doing a debrief rounds, um, getting staff together, nurses and doctors, so that they um, can share their difficult experiences because many people are struggling. Um, rostering, of course, in middle of the sickness is, is something really um, challenging, but so far we have been, we've been able to function. Uh, depletion of resources is a big fear, but thankfully in my hospital and in my trust, we had PPE continuously for the last six weeks. There was sometimes uh, scary times, but we, we never had zero PPE. Uh, another big challenge that um, we are now dealing with is doctor visibility at the bedside, because what's happening when you have a massive number of patients and all your unit is covered and you uh, have to go into PPE to go in, the nurses will feel that they are isolated a little bit at the bedside inside the unit and they will need to see the doctors more. So we are now rearranging the daytime to try to make sure a doctor is reachable easily and visible to the nurses all the time. Um, the, the pressure on the nurses at the front line is really, really heavy, uh, but we are working on it in London. Um, at the end, I just uh, want to share uh, the best graph that I have seen in years, and that's London until yesterday. And you can see that our intensive, sorry, that's Northwest London until yesterday. And you can see that our numbers are finally decreasing and I'm hoping to see more and more of that. Um, and I wish you all the best uh, and wish you stay safe from London. I hope that was useful. Uh, thank you, Ahmed. It was very great, uh, a little bit, uh, a lot, uh, some grief uh, in your sound, but uh, we are very grateful for your uh, chair. And uh, for the sake of time, your time and uh, meeting time, we'll start our, our questions immediately uh, by you. Uh, and um, we apologize for our, uh, all our attendee from uh, different parts of the Egypt or, and outside Egypt. Uh, because we are very short of time, uh, we'll take uh, one or two questions for each speaker, mostly, uh, because they are running out of time. Uh, Ahmed, uh, you, you have spoken a lot about having uh, teams for everything. Do you find uh, the, the idea of having a team for intubation, team for uh, procedures, team for lines, team for every, uh, for CPR maybe, uh, does it make sense it will decrease uh, the, the, the infection rate, or uh, you don't have an idea till now, is it possible to be much more better in reducing the infection? Um, I think it will actually reduce the infection rate because I have been witnessing, uh, just to give you an example, I have been witnessing the efficiency of our intubation teams. And basically those people come and do 12 hour shifts. There are four of them, two anesthetic consultants and an ODP and a nurse. and and when we had the very busy uh, start four weeks ago, they used to intubate six patients a shift. Um, by the end of the shift, they have done intubation with the PPE six times, and they have been getting more and more efficient. And I think efficiency decreased the infection rate for sure, because you don't have random movements. You know, everyone knows what they're doing. Um, and also one very big, Think about the specialist teams, like especially the intubation teams, it's taking the anxiety of everyone. Because if you're looking after a, a, an ICU of 15 patients and you don't want to be running around to intubate that patient who is getting worse, you just know that you will generate this call and a team will come and do this while you look after the rest of the patients. So um, I, think, I think it's useful on every front. I think it was the best thing that we have done. Perfect. Uh, what about, uh, uh, have you managed to put a proning team or not yet? Yes, yes. Actually, um, it's, uh, it's really emotional for me, the proning team. So the proning team is led by our physiotherapist. But you have no idea mm. how many people volunteer to do this, especially people who cannot do intensive care. Like yesterday in my proning team, I had uh, one of our very senior professors helping prone. Oh. Uh, and okay. I had one of our... Uh, 
world famous surgeons uh, being part of the proning team. So those are people who are very senior doctors. They know that they don't have the intensive care skill, but they're just here to help. And uh, you have like a very, very senior professor who was our hospital director many years ago. He's oh, helping the, the perfect, perfect. therapist to prone patients. It was really, it meant a lot to everyone really. Okay, but but uh, uh, to to, find, to finalize this, uh, do you have any age limitation for the physicians and nurses who are entering your uh, your unit for this service? Age of fifty or uh, some centers are uh, we, obliging. We, mm? we don't, we don't. Which brings us to uh, one of our issues is the risk to some of the staff. Some of my, some of us have chronic diseases. Some of us are in the high risk age range. Yes, but what yes. I have been seeing. Uh, really in the NHS is that everyone is uh, very, very strong and wanting to help. The government and us, we never put any limitations on anyone. We just had guidance that we should try to minimize exposure of high-risk groups like people with chronic diseases. But uh, no age our, limit. Yeah, but our senior doctors are helping all over the place. Perfect, perfect. We hope you uh, enjoy a uh, better outcome the next uh, couple of weeks and thank you. <laughs> I'm hoping so. Thank you so much, Ahmed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I need to ask a couple of questions, uh, please, Dr. Walid, for Dr. Ahmed uh, Labib. Uh, first, uh, a very uh, a very good question coming to you from the audience about if you don't have an FFP3, uh, uh, is, enough, is it enough to use FFP2 in the, uh, in the areas which do you don't have the FFP3 or not? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes, definitely. Yeah, hi, Dr. Gandhi. Uh, about the FFP2 and FFP3, uh, so the difference between both is just uh, uh, the scale of protection. With the FFP2, they say it's around 94% uh, protection against aerosol, uh, but with the FFP3, it's up to 98%. Uh, so uh, I can say you can use uh, the FFP2. Uh, for AGPs, we use the FFP3. Always we use the FFP3. Uh, it's, it, as I said, it's your personal safety comes first as a healthcare provider. If you've got a mask that provides 94% protection versus a mask that uh, uh, provides 98%, I will go for the, uh, for the FFP3. Uh, and if you don't have in your facility uh, um, except the FFP2, I can tell you what to use. It depends on the hospital policy and your national guidelines. If your national guidelines say that you only got this and you have to use this, there is no other way but use them. But if you have both, then you have to use FFP3, not the FFP2. Okay, thank you, Dr. Ahmed. Uh, uh, do you think there is a difference between using gowns or aprons in the, uh, in the uh, AG uh, uh, procedures, uh, surgery-related procedures? Yeah, you have to wear the gowns because it's long sleeve. The aprons, uh, if you've got uh, the long sleeve aprons, uh, I guess if you can, if you only have the aprons, long sleeve aprons, you can use them. But uh, most of the aprons, they, they are a short sleeve. You can't use short sleeve for AGPs. You no, no, I think, I think uh, I, I'm not clear. If you use the aprons, which is uh, the overall suit, you do, oh, yeah. you do use the overall suits. Somebody uh, always uh, uh, speak uh, about uh, using them as an apron. I, I'm, I'm, I'm asking about the overall suits. So uh, it's good that you're asking about this question because just uh, yesterday uh, uh, they added the uh, National Health England, they added the overalls to the guidelines for uh, PPE. As I said in my talk, guidelines are uh, being uh, uh, evolved every day and it's changed at least twice a week. And the overalls, they, they just have been added yesterday to the protocol. If your hospitals are providing them, you can use them in, 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 during AGPs. But the problem with overall is that you have to be more careful during doffing because there is a possibility that you can get infected if you're not well uh, trained to use them are higher than using just the regular PPE you're using. So okay. if you get good training, if you have a buddy, a buddy is a person who, who is just watching you. Uh, he's a colleague. He doesn't have to be a doctor. He, he can be a nurse. He can be a healthcare assistant who's watching you, watching you donning and watching you doffing, making sure you're doing it right and you're doing it in the proper way. So if you've got mm -hmm. a body that's watching you and telling you what to do, and you, you're well trained to use over here, yeah, you can use it for, uh, for AGPs. It's actually, it's just, it was just added yesterday. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Ahmed, and uh, we are very glad to hear from you from the UK and hope you are coming back uh, in a new by vacation. I hope so. And, uh, it's it's <laughs> very glad to, to see you and hear from you, Dr. Gandhi. It's always Thank fun. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Moving to Ahmed Mahdi, uh, we need to, to go through the questions very fast. So, Ahmed, uh, you, you, you got us uh, in the middle of a very difficult situation with a lot of uh, data. What do you think if you don't have a negative pressure rooms enough, Dr. Ahmed? If, yeah, if you don't actually, have... Uh, yes. Yes, actually, this is a problem, actually, if you have, as we have mentioned, in the last slides, the, 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 nation, the nation resources are one of the most important factors in minimizing the spread of the infection. And uh, unfortunately, if you don't have negative pressure room, you have to tailor your uh, precautions based on the resources of the, of the hospital. So it means you can use some, some, some sort of HEBA filter near the patient's head. You can be directly adhered with the other precautions like uh, completely PPE, like minimizing the personnel, like all, all precautions as much as you can to avoid the, uh, any contamination from the aerosolized procedures. But as we have mentioned in the past, we have negative pressure rooms, but if you don't have it, you can find the other way. Okay, what about a uh, very, very nice question from the audience about having, uh, if, if you have uh, 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 the timing for donning and doffing, this uh, was a question for both of you and Ahmed Labib. Uh, if, you, if you take your time for donning and doffing uh, in the case of CPR, um, what about the couple of minutes you you spend uh, donning and doffing? Do, what do you think? Is it is it uh, a difficult situation or uh, what you are handling uh, this situation? How do you well, are handling this situation? Actually, I, I can give I can give the Labib also to reply on that. But I I mean, one from the very very big challenges actually with CBR and in, in, in clinical practice. You really you need time. You need to minimize the time actually to restate your patient early, but the uh, PPE protections, it is the priority in such situation. So at least you have to minimize the time. You have to have a one rescue if he can uh, wear the PPE. So you can just put, for example, not a breather mask for the vision of the oxygen during that time until you have completely protected by one personnel. Then you have to start to proceed for the algorithm. But keep in your mind chest compressions as well as defibrillations, especially chest compression. Don't do it without PPE, but others can be. For example, if I operator, you can just put with the patterns and you can proceed. It can be accepted until the second rescue will come. And just face mask, don't do bag mask, don't do, don't initiate any aerosolization for the procedures until you're completing PPE. So one can play the job until the others can wear PPE. And during the time, just obviously mask can help during the rest Thank you, Ahmed. Any, any additional? Any yeah. additional? Oh, I have you have a last question after uh, Dr. Labib. Yes. Yeah, so so uh, uh, three days ago, the UK Res uh, Resource Council updated its uh, guidelines regarding uh, PPE and uh, cardiac arrest. So uh, cardiac arrest, uh, chest compressions, they are not considered so AGPs, just chest compressions. So whoever is caring for the patient in the ward always is using his PPE, uh, the, uh, the, the orange uh, part of the table. So he's wearing his surgical gown, he's wearing his plastic apron and his uh, non-disposable gowns. He starts uh, uh, chest compression and attach the uh, AED, the automated defibrillators, and start, start chest compression and call for the cardiac arrest team. The cardiac arrest team arrives in full PPE because the cardiac arrest team has an anesthetist on board, has an, a, a, a medic and has uh, uh, some- It's a matter of time. It's a matter, it's just, uh, the question is about timing. He will take, he, he's, he should be always uh, uh, in his uh, PPE or he's always dressing and donning and doffing. I said uh, all the patients are three, all the patients here are treated as suspected cases. So okay. you're always wearing your PPE. Yes, yes, you're, yes. You're wearing the PPE with a surgical mask and apron, not the full PPE. Ah, you, j just, um, yes, yes. So you will start chest compression because chest compression is not considered an AGP. Yes. Until the cardiac arrest team arrives and they take over the, the care for the patient, they start chest compression, they continue chest compression and they either intubate the patient or whatever, it's according to the ALS protocol. But the, the, the cardiac arrest team, they arrive in full PPE. But yes. It's very important. The healthcare provider who's starting chest compression is not doing any airbag mask ventilation because this is aerosol generating. Chest compression is not considered AGP, but airbag mask ventilation is considered. Okay, thank you. What uh, last question to uh, to Madi uh, uh, and excusing Dr. Walid for one single minute, Dr. Madi. 
One single minute. I'm asking about uh, the what's new in the pipelines. I, I know that uh, the American Heart Association had just um, uh, uh, published today uh, new guidelines for the CPR during the COVID-19. Do you have any idea about uh, any updates or any extra data? You have just uh, uh, shown us some of it. Yes, actually, I, I did post. Actually, if you if you if you attend the lectures, I just did post the key principles for the American Heart Associations. I posted in my lectures, which is the main priority as all providing protection for healthcare providers. Second one, maximize oxygenation and minimize actually the average oxygenation time. At the end, the third key principle for the American Heart Associations is he the planning for the patients for a station does his DNR or you can adjust when you can determine or terminate the CBR. So this is the three key principles actually, but in details we have mentioned how to deal with this one. By uh, this, is, this is actually published today, but not only by American Heart Association, but most of the institutions in the USA they did publish this, this protocol today. I highlighted in my lecture. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed. Uh, Thank many you. thanks to Dr. Ahmed Madi, Dr. Ahmed Labib, Dr. Ahmed Haddad, and our uh, late speaker, Dr. Yazir Zaghloul. By this, we'll end the first session. <laughs>